Well, author and journalist Mona El Tahawi isn't afraid to court controversy. Her 2012 essay, Why Do They Hate Us, was a searing indictment of what she says is a pervasive culture of misogyny, even outright hatred of women in the Middle East. She furthers that thesis in her new book. It is called Headscarves and Hymens, Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. And we welcome her to our studio. Hi. Well, you're a provocative one, aren't you? I try my best. Okay, I want to I want to start with reading um, a bit from your book. This is a passage. Okay, here we go. There's no sugar coating it, you write, Mona. We Arab women live in a culture that is fundamentally hostile to us, enforced by men's contempt. Name me an Arab country, and I'll recite a litany of abuses against women occurring in that country. Abuses fueled by a toxic mix of culture and religion that few seem willing to disentangle, lest they blaspheme or offend. What all this means is that when it comes to the status of women in the Arab world, it's not better than you think. It's much, much worse. There's a lot to unpack just even in that paragraph there, a par couple of paragraphs. There's lots to unpack in your book. We will do that, but I want to start with just the basics. So you write this 2012 essay. Why did you want to write this book? I wanted to expand on the essay and I wanted to take this moment, which is you know, an extremely special moment for those of us from the Arabic speaking countries of the Middle East and North Africa. You know, in, I, I remember growing up in Egypt and thinking, you know, where is the revolution? There was so much injustice, whether it was political corruption, whether it was human rights violations, whether it was the, you know, the, the poverty everywhere. And especially for me as an Egyptian woman, as a Muslim woman, um, to see this moment of the revolution finally, and yet, to see half of society being told constantly to wait, wait, wait until when? Mm. So that's why I wrote my book. Wait, and wait for what? For all these rights that we're demanding. Because you know, when, when you saw people go to the streets to rise up against Mubarak or Gaddafi or any of the other countries, Tunisia, um, Bahrain, Yemen, Syria, it was, from a, it was born from a realization that the regime oppresses everybody, men and women. But when we look around at the men who were marching with us, I think we as women realize that the state, the street, and the home oppressed us as women specifically. And so when we start to say that, because the revolution has definitely galvanized women, and, and I hear women now saying, the revolution taught me to say no, the revolution taught me to say I demand, this word I demand, or these words I demand. But then, you know, people say things like, look, there are 42,000 political prisoners in Egypt, which is horrific. So wait until they're released. Wait until we end torture. Wait until when? Now, Martin Luther King Jr. had this um, great line in his um, letters from a Birmingham jail where he said, basically, people who keep saying wait, they're basically saying it's never going to happen. Hmm. Who's telling you to wait? Oh, God, everybody. The state, the street, and the home. The, those really are the, that's the trifecta that I'm fighting against. That's the trifecta that my book fights against. And that's the trifecta that has kept women and girls in the Middle East and North Africa basically stuck between those two paradigms that are in the title of my book, the headscarves and the hymens. They've reduced us to what's on our heads and what's in between our legs. Okay, let's, um, well, I want to get into that quote, but here's what you said. You said, basically, name an Arab country, an Arab-speaking Middle Eastern North African country, just to be precise, and you can recite a litany of abuses. So let's start with the home country, your home country of Egypt. How would you characterize the status of women in Egypt? Well, if I, if I can, doing it through the, sti the, the state, the street, and the home, as I mentioned, this trifecta, when it comes to the state, in March of 2011, just a month after Hosni Mubarak stepped down, after the uprising and begun, um, the military very infamously conducted so-called virginity tests, which were basically sexual assaults against our female revolutionaries. These are heroes of the revolution. There were at least 17 women who were stripped of their headscarves, stripped from head to toe, and a military doctor basically stuck his two fingers up their vaginal opening, supposedly in search of a hymen. So this is the state. When it comes to the street, I'm talking about epidemic levels of street sexual harassment. According to a United Nations survey, 99.3% of Egyptian girls and women experience street sexual harassment. Now, my friends and I joke that the 0.7% that don't apparently experience it just weren't there when they called them up for the survey. <laughs> it's that bad. It's an epidemic. Now, when it comes to the home, I'm talking about the earliest form of violence, which is female genital mutilation or cutting, which happens to girls as young as five or six. I'm talking about domestic violence that is very rarely punished because according to Egyptian law, a man can beat his wife with quote unquote good intention. And that means not bruising her face. And I'm also talking about marital rape, which is not criminalized in the Egyptian penal code. Well, in broad strokes, and let's go through your three sort of, the trifecta as you call it. Um, <laughs> 
I'm only laughing because it, it, it's sort of a strange question to ask this about what is it? Why do Egyptian men feel so threatened by women? Well, I mean, I, I have, you know, I'm, I'm a woman driven by a lot of anger and I'm taken to rants. <laughs> and one of my rants, as I call them, uh, where I ask, you know, why do they hate us? I, you know, I think it's, it's a mix of things. I think um, men feel entitled to privilege. Men feel entitled to women's bodies. Men feel threatened by women. Men feel that women control both their ability to control themselves and men's temptation and men's ability to resist. So many things. So I think on the body of women and girls, so much is projected. And in now, I don't by any stretch of the imagination, of my imagination at least, claim that this is just specific or unique to Arab men. Well, because I was asking that, I mean, as you sort of laid that out, I'm like, what's the Egyptian context for all of this? The Egyptian context for it is, is that trifecta because it allows this to happen. But you know, I mentioned many times in my book that misogyny, this kind of misogyny that, that does all of this on the bodies of girls and women and on the emotions and on the psyche, this is called misogyny. And there is no country on earth that has er erased misogyny. What has happened instead is that on this kind of continuum, if you like, of misogyny, some countries have been fighting the feminist fight much longer than others and have managed to come, you know, they, they, they lie further along that continuum. In Egypt, we haven't had a concerted enough feminist struggle so that we can criminalize marital rape, so that we can end female genital mutilation. So I know that one of the things that I'm often kind of hit back with is, are you saying that there's something in the DNA of men in the region that makes them especially misogynistic? I'm saying no, there is an institutionalized misogyny because of that trifecta that has allowed men who in other countries are basically stopped because of laws against sexual violence, laws against marital rape, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I bet you get hit back with this one too. We're talking about 50% of society. We're lumping, first let's talk about the men, we're lumping them as, as all the same. But there's the other 50%, which is the women. And you must get hit back. Well, I don't see a lot of people, Mona, a lot of women in Egypt sort of waving the flag of feminism. We'll talk about Arab feminists um, tomorrow when, when we talk more. but. I, you know, are you represent, how representative is, is Mona El Tahawi about what is happening um, on the streets of Egypt, in the homes of, e of Egypt? Well, I mean, one of the things that I always resist is this idea that I'm speaking on behalf of everybody and I'm the voice of the voiceless because everybody has a voice, nobody is voiceless, but what happens to that voice? Where I think I'm, what, I, what I'm trying to do is to amplify voices that you don't hear either because they've been silenced intentionally because I was one of many women sexually assaulted during protests in Egypt, but several of the women who were assaulted during the same time I was have been intentionally silenced by their families. So that voice that everybody has has either been silenced by their family or they don't have the platform that I have. So in that sense, that platform that I have gives me a great deal of privilege. Mm. And I believe that if one has privilege, one is obliged to fight 10 times harder than those who don't have privilege. Not to give a voice to the voiceless, but to amplify voices that you don't necessarily hear. But I want to keep moving around the Middle East and North Africa because I don't want to just single out Egypt, as you say, this is a problem across the region. So another country you know well, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. well known for mm -hmm. its persecution uh, of women. They're not allowed to drive unless they're driving with mm -hmm. someone in their family. But um, what was your experience like in Saudi? Well, we moved to Saudi Arabia when I was 15 from the UK. And it, it was uh, really, really difficult. My mother was the main breadwinner for the family. My, fa my father didn't have a job, and so he was basically taking care of us and cooking, and my mother was, he was making dinner and my mother was working and we were happy with that arrangement. We go to Saudi Arabia and all of a sudden my mother says she felt like she had become paralyzed because she couldn't drive. We became utterly dependent on my father for mobility. But the other thing I learned in Saudi Arabia was that basically women were the walking embodiment of sin. Everything about a woman was a sin. That's what I was picking up from Saudi Arabia. I'm a Muslim as I said, but that was not the Islam that I was brought up with. And it became very quickly apparent that the Saudi system which again is a mix of religion and culture, was determined to keep women children their entire lives. Women need the permission of a male guardian to do everything from um, getting the simplest of surgical procedures, from, tra from traveling, and obviously they're not allowed to drive. And it's not just not driving unless they're in the presence of a family member, they just cannot drive. So sometimes a woman will find herself in the ludicrous position of having her son having to sign a piece of paper to allow her, a university professor, to leave the country. Mm. That is just ridiculous. Except for about, you know, when I lived in the Middle East and we'd have these kinds of discussions, I'm not saying everyone, but sort of the pushback that I would get is that, yes, um, out on the streets, women from a 
from a Western perspective, may not have a lot of power. But inside the home, Pia, that, that's where they're ruling things inside their home. I get that so much time. Oh, it infuriates me, Pia. I can't believe people say this. First of all, we're not inside the home so that we can follow, you know, these family dynamics. But again, I, you know, consistently, there, there are indices and there are surveys that, that show us just how bad it gets. And I mentioned several of them in my book. Egypt, Lebanon, so many other countries in the region. Now, Lebanon is usually considered a much more lo open and progressive country. The surveys done on domestic violence there show horrific levels of acceptance by women of domestic violence. In Egypt, several, you know, I think almost 50% of women who have been subjected to domestic violence say that they accept it and they expect it. And the reasons are, if I burn dinner, if I speak to a foreign man, a strange man who isn't my relative, you know, just ridiculous reasons that they think gives their husband or their father the right to beat them. What that says to me is that there is an internalization of this subjugation that I'm talking about because of the, tri the trifecta. In the home, again, I talked about female genital mutilation. Now, mothers do it to their daughters, not because they hate their daughters, but they obviously remember the pain of their own cutting operation or procedure when they were young, but because they know that the father expects it and the husband expects it. Mm. So who has the power here? If, uh, if a mother is willing to uh, make her daughter go through unnecessary, an unnecessary procedure that she knows is incredibly painful and traumatic, why is she doing it? Because of the father and because of the husband. Where is this power? I want to pick up on something you were just talking about a little bit earlier because I just I want to know if there's a, a, a real distinction. So we're talking about the Arab world, so Middle East, North Africa, um, and you said in Egypt at least there the differences between whether you're a Copt, Christian Copt, mm -hmm. or you're or you're a Muslim. When you look around the region, how much does religion play in terms of oppression? If you mm -hmm. look at Lebanon or various mm -hmm. other countries mm -hmm. that are more, more multi-religious. Mm -hmm. Lebanon is an example is one country that, that I spend quite a bit of time on in my book because Lebanon um, very recently passed a law against domestic violence finally it spent almost 10 years awaiting approval from the Lebanese parliament one of the main hitches other than the, the, the political kind of ups and downs of Lebanon which are specific to that country one of the main hitches is, is very very familiar to everybody in the region and that was the objections of the religious leaders in Lebanon to wording in that law and it was from both the Christian community and the Muslim community. So it wasn't just specific to Islam. So it was the, the leaders of the, the, the various Christian sects, because Lebanon is a country, as you know, of many sects, I think 18 or 19. So the Christian leadership and the Muslim leadership were all united in their opposition to language in that domestic violence law that criminalizes marital rape. And it got so bad because these religious leaders were so opposed to it that now this domestic violence law, which is good in some aspects, actually removed any kind of legal opposition to cr uh, marital rape. So basically, men have the right to rape their wives, mm -hmm. whether they're Christian or Muslim, because of the interference of the Christian and Muslim leadership in Lebanon. Okay, let me bring up another country, Tunisia, where the Arab Spring mm -hmm. was born, um, a country that is seen within the context of the Middle East and North Africa with being more progressive mm -hmm. than other countries. Passed a constitution last year. Mm -hmm. It guarantees equality for men and women mm -hmm. before the law. Uh, it has a commitment from the state mm -hmm. to protect women's rights. Mm -hmm. Sounds pretty good. It does, and I was very happy to visit. I, I visited Tunisia three times since their revolution and since they got rid of Zina, Zinedine al Abidine. When I spoke to women there, I spoke to um, women on the Constituent Assembly who voted for that, that article in the, uh, in the Constitution to guarantee equality. I spoke to an academic who set up an art center for young people in, a, in one of the biggest slums in all of, uh, of the continent of Africa. And I spoke to a mother and her daughter living in this disadvantaged neighborhood. And they all said to me, first of all, it's great to have this wording, but how are we going to realize it? You know, is it really going to have an impact on our life? Number one. Secondly, after the removal of uh, uh, Ben Ali, Zinedine uh, Abedin uh, Ben Ali, um, one of the things that the women uh, uh, are most afraid of is the growing influence of the uh, religious conservatives. So these are the Salafi groups and Nahda, who are much more progressive than the Salafi groups, but are still regarded a, a, a political Islamic movement. And the things that I was getting from academics and this woman who runs the art center in the disadvantaged neighborhood is that there are groups of men either on campus or in these neighborhoods who are demanding that women start to wear headscarves. Under Ben Ali, women could not wear headscarves. It was against the law, which a lot of women felt fairly uh, you know, disadvantaged by. But since, his, since Ben Ali's removal, 
those who wanted to wear headscarves began to, but, but there was a movement to push women. And this particular professor I interviewed said that she was threatened with violence, and some of her students that she worked with were threatened with violence. And this mother and daughter that I spoke to in the neighborhood, the daughter wears a headscarf and her mother doesn't. And her mother says, we have these men who patrol the neighborhood who are scaring my clients. She runs, she, she works in a hair salon. So my, my, my question about a country like Tunisia is I'm very glad that the women in the Constituent Assembly were able to, to, bring, to put together this wording in, in the Constitution. But how much of a commitment are they going to get from the men in, the, in, in politics? And how much is this going to translate to especially those disadvantaged neighborhoods where women feel the most threatened by the religious conservatives who now feel that Ben Ali's gone now and, this, and we can challenge the secularism of Tunisia? Here's the thing, though, Mona, as we you know, go around the region and look at various countries, there are those who will say, look, you can look at, look at ourselves, look at North Americans. Women got the right to vote. Things didn't ch ch change overnight. Isn't just going to take time, Mona? Isn't this just, we're just at the beginning of this revolutionary phase. So this Should is I, the, the weight thing, right? This is, <laughs> well, it's, it's a bit like, it, perhaps weight, but perhaps also that maybe your expectations are too big right now. That it's only been a few years. Well, I mean, it has only just been four years since we got rid of Mubarak or since the revolution began. But I think that unless we begin to talk about these things now, when we do start to focus on the things that we can finally fix, we, we, how much of a catch-up do we have to do? And I'm talking about not just, OK, look, we've got four years now. Let's start working on it. The, the things that I mentioned in my book have been things that have been happening for decades. We've been trying to fight female genital mutilation or cutting in Egypt for almost 100 years. 100 years, which says to me that this is so ingrained. It's practiced by Muslims and Christians. It's so ingrained, it, it needs a concerted fight. And that fight needs to start now. We're talking about a country like Saudi Arabia, where you know when, when it was time to start giving girls education, uh, their major clerics were against it. This is a country which in 2002, 15 schoolgirls burnt to death in 2002, and nobody was punished. And they burned to death because the religious police, the morality police, would not let them out of school because they weren't wearing veils. So this was in 2002, and up, up until today, nothing has happened. So my, my question is, unless we start talking about gender equality with a sense of urgency, this political revolution that we've began is going to fail, because all we're doing is we're playing musical chairs. Look at Egypt. We got rid of Mubarak. We got a 19-member junta that was basically 19 Mubaraks. After we got rid of the 19 Mubaraks, we got Mohamed Morsi, who wasn't that great himself. After Mohamed Morsi was overthrown, we got Sisi, who was now back to military rule because he was head of military intelligence. So what has really changed on the political level? So the, the theory that I, that I posit in my book is that without the, the social and the sexual revolution, which is about taking the revolution home, that political revolution will fail because that trifecta of state, street, and home mm. will continue to be run by vari variations of Mubarak. So unless we overthrow Mubarak in the bedroom and in our minds, that's what I say in my book, the real Mubaraks who are ruining our countries will always be in power. Here's the, I'll read a quote. It, it picks up on where we, what you've sort of been saying. This is from um, Nasreen Malik, who's a Sudanese-born writer. She wrote in The Guardian. It was um, in response to your essay that came out in Foreign Policy. So here's a little bit about Nasreen Roach. She said, yes, in Saudi Arabia, women cannot drive, but men cannot elect their government. Instead, they are ruled over by a religiously opportunistic dynasty. In Egypt, it's true that women were subjected to virginity tests, but men were sodomized. In Sudan, women are lashed for wearing trousers, but ethnic minorities are also marginalized and under assault. We must not belittle the issues women face or relegate them to second place, but we must place them in a wider context where wholesale reform is needed. One, one cannot reduce a much more universal and complicated problem merely to gender. I think you and Nasreen probably have some common ground there, saying, look at all these horrible things that are happening. Mm -hmm. I guess her point is, um, we're all in this together. I mean, men and women are facing a common enemy here. Mm -hmm. What would you say to her? Well, first of all, I mean, Nasreen and I don't have to agree. I think that one of, one of my, the, the things that that annoy me the most when I talk about feminism and misogyny in the Middle East and North Africa is that everybody expects women of the same cultural and faith background to agree. You know, like with, with a white feminist, no one would ever say to her, Oh, Gloria Steinem, by the way, Camille Panglia disagrees with you. <laughs> and, and so what, is, Gloria, point, is Gloria point. Steinem supposed to say now, oh, no, you know, we must all, you know, have uniform values. So I think that, I think that it's time to recognize and appreciate that, that women from the Middle East and North Africa 
even if they're all of the same faith background, because Nisreen and I are both Muslim, don't have to agree. So there are things that Nisreen and I very, very much disagree on, and that is fine. But I think, but this idea that everybody has it bad, what, what am I supposed to do then? Just throw my arms up in the air and say, oh, okay, it's bad for everybody. <laughs> you know, that takes me again back to that, you know, that weight thing. Yes, it's bad for everybody, but I am talking about 50% of society. You know, women are constantly listed under minorities. We are not a minority. And, and my point is, you know, again and again, I stress it, unless we talk about gender equality, unless we have that social sexual revolution, the, the rights of the ethnic minorities in Sudan will not be fixed. The, 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 the ability of men to be safe from sodomy in, in political prisons will not, they will not be saved from that. So if we are able to treat girls and women like this, and that is 50% of our society, that says everything. So, you know, my rage against misogyny will not be abated just by being told that our political prisoners mm. also suffer, our ethnic minorities suffer. I know this. I know that region very well. I am talking about 50% of society, and I will not let go of this idea that gender equality is the key to our freedom. You write in your book about cultural relativism as well, and I want to read you a little bit of what you wrote for our audience's sake. Um, here we go. Culture evolves, but it will remain static if outsiders consistently silence criticism in a misguided attempt to save us from ourselves. Cultures evolve through dissent and robust criticism from their members. When Westerners remain silent out of, quote, respect for foreign cultures, they show support only for the most conservative elements of those cultures. Cultural relativism is as much my enemy as the oppression I fight within my culture and faith. There, I mean, Mona, here's the thing. I, I read that, I think of myself, I freak out. I, I think most Westerners do. What the mm. heck is our role in, mm. in all of this? Yes. Why do you think Westerners remain silent on yes. these issues? Well, I make a distinction when it comes you know, to the so-called West because you know, I, I see a very racist, xenophobic, and Islamophobic political right wing. I see them because I'm, I'm often hit by a lot of their hate. And clearly, I disagree with everything that they represent. But I also see you know, a seemingly well-meaning left wing. And politically, I, I identify as an anarchist. So I am a leftist. But I see the left, or the so-called left, in many Western countries. And because they want to fight that right wing with its xenophobia and Islamophobia, they choose to remain silent. And even worse, not just silent, they try to silence sometimes women like myself from that culture and from that faith background. As you know, it's, it's like this kind of ludicrous attempt to save my own culture and my own religion from me, a woman who was shaped and formed by that culture and religion. Now, both of those are not helping me at all because this side is saying, oh, stop telling us all these bad things because you're just arming them. And, those are, and the right wing is using my words and saying, you see, even one of them is saying it that bad. I'm not interested in either of those because at the end of the day, neither of those are those girls and women that I'm talking about. And I myself chose to move back to Egypt and I've spent most of my life living in the Middle East and North Africa. Those girls and women are the ones that are pay the price for that misogyny, not the left and not the right in the West. Here, Mandy suggests there's, there's a third reason that Westerners don't do it, and it is this. It's that women there or people there need to own it. Who am I to tell them? I can support them. Of course I support them morally, but who am I to get, put a horse in this race? What would you say to that? Well, see, I, I, I have never, ever asked anyone to come and rescue us, and whenever I'm asked, you know, because I do a lot of readings and public speaking, I'm always asked, what can I do to help you and help women from where you're from? And I say, absolutely nothing. What you can do to help me is help women in your community. So when I speak in the US, I, I remind people of how the religious right over there has completely, almost completely eroded reproductive rights in many southern states. So I say, you know what? Support the right for women's reproductive rights. Here in Canada, for example, I talk about what has happened to Aboriginal women and, and the police neglect when it comes to violence against Aboriginal women. I say, you know what? You have your own issues here in Canada. Talk about them. And the reason that I do that is because I, I honestly believe that when we all fight for gender equality in our various communities, we, write, we lift up the cause of global feminism. But what I do require from those who remain silent out of cultural relativism is at least some vocal support, some recognition that myself and other women from my own background have owned this. Mm -hmm. I give the names of many feminists from Saudi Arabia, from Tunisia, from Morocco, who are fighting this fight. So I'm saying, listen to our voices. Understand that we are fighting the good fight. Don't come in here and you know save us on your white horses, but at least give us some vocal support. Uh, but a lot of my message as well is to criticize foreign administrations. So whether it's the US administration or the Canadian government or anyone, the Canadian government sells 
billions of dollars worth of weapons to the Saudis. When they sit down and they sign all those contracts, do so they sit there and say to the Saudis, stop treating your women like five-year-old girls? I imagine the conversation to go something like this. The Saudis would go, it's none of your business. It's our religion and culture. The Canadians should say, you know what? It is our business because these are human rights. Because women's rights are human rights, and we are a global community. And we will not continue to support a miso misogynistic regime with our weapons. But that's never going to happen because no government wants to lose money. So that is part of my fight against cultural relativism. The willful silence of various Western administrations that, that undermine my fight. You saw what happened when the Swedish foreign minister tried to implement a so-called for feminist foreign policy. I always thought Canada was a feminist foreign policy country. Always. What has happened? What has the Harper government done to this so-called feminist foreign policy? Not a lot. Um, we're going to pick up on our conversation uh, from this tomorrow. We're going to meet some of the feminists that you talked about. That we don't, we've never heard their names, so we'll talk about that tomorrow night. Thank you for this. Thank you, Pia. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.